Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He said, uh, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Father, I pray that you would help us today to feed the church of God that you purchased with your own blood. I pray you'd draw sinners to repentance and faith. I pray men would be honest with themselves and Lord, uh, allow the Spirit of God to examine them while the truth of God's been preached. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to worship in spirit and truth today. Thank you so much for what you've already done. And Lord, we look forward to what else you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, I want to try to preach just a little bit today on this thought of the mind of Christ. And, uh, you know, this chapter opens up with some pretty good admonitions about us being, you know, he said, you fulfill my joy by being like-minded. And uh, we ought to be like-minded. We ought to have the same goals and things of that nature in, in, uh, in, in mind some, uh, that we want to achieve here. He said, talks about uh, having the same love and of being of one accord. And that's when things go good. When people are all on the same page and they're heading in the same direction and good things are happening, the, uh, one of my greatest fear was always getting in the God's way and messing something good up. Right. Uh, but he says, look, don't do nothing through strife. Uh, vain glory, you know, just to get a, somebody to say, hey, man, you're great at what you're doing. You just like hearing that. And uh, he said, but do it with all lowliness of mind. Just thank God that he allows you to do it. And he said we ought to esteem one another higher than the other. That goes totally against our present day. And, and trust me, it's been always since... It was, the reason he wrote it then, it, it was going on then, and it was going on in, before the foundation of the earth when they came along. Man's always had that issue of everybody wants to be out front. And, uh, but uh, he tells us to look on each other's needs and not our own. Sometimes it does us good just to look around at what we have instead of what we don't have. Uh, sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. And we can't see how blessed we truly are. Uh, you know, we live in a country now, and I tell folks, I said, we've all got all kind of stuff. I said, we've got so much stuff that our closets are crammed full. Under the bed is crammed full. We got buildings in the backyard, they're crammed full. Now we're going out and renting rooms and storage from people out in town, and they're crammed full. And we're complaining about what we don't have. And I'm telling you, it's a blessing that uh, we're all a bunch of pack rats. We got so much that we can have that, uh, have that kind of life. Amen? Sometimes we need to look at what other people don't have that we do have. And, uh, but, and, but, but he says here, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, he's telling us to have the mind of Christ. I want you to think like Jesus Christ is what he's saying. And uh, the Bible's clear about that. And uh, if you want to know what God thinks, you know what you do? You read his Bible. There's a lot of people, they've never went to church, and if they have, it's been years ago. They've never read the Bible. They know nothing about it, but yet they've got an opinion about church and church people and God's Word, and they know nothing about it. And then they want to talk about us being ignorant. Amen? And, uh, but look here. Uh, you know what? You want to know about what's going on in Israel? Just read your Bible. And you want to know what's going on in the last days? There's a lot of people making a lot of crooked money off of uh, uh, books on Israel and the last days. 
Look, I've read my Bible enough to know this, just real quick, like Israel has always been going through what they're going through. Right. It's Hamas today, it was the Philistines a thousand years ago, and on down the road, it's going to be the rest of the world against them. But look, Israel always wins. Right. That, look here, and we as God's people, in spite of everything falling apart, we wind up in heaven. The ebb and flow of life is you're up, you're down, you're in the middle, but you're somewhere, and you're going to make it. Amen. 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 And uh, so he tells us here that uh, what's going on in society. You want to know what God thinks about your home? How you should dress, how you should live your life, how you should raise your children, spend your money, how you should treat your neighbor, how you ought to act at work. That just read your Bible, and that's a good guideline right there. Amen. And, uh, you know, when you think about science, look, we're not a bunch of flat earthers here. You know, I have people tell me all the time, they say, you're foolish to believe that a, one man with a jawbone of an ass killed 1,000 men. And that a guy with nothing more than a Happy Meal fed uh, thousands of people and had stuff left over. And I said, yeah, and you're a guy that believes that a monkey turned into a human being, so who's the idiot here? Amen? That's the way you ought to think about that thing. But uh, the scriptures, when you go off to Bible college, and, and I've always, I've got to where I say a lot about this. There's preachers going out the back door believing less than what they did coming in the front door. Right, right. School is uh, to educate you about what God said, about what God, uh, not what's right about the Bible, not what's wrong about it. And preachers just need to get back to preaching the Bible. Amen. And so he says, uh, if you want to know what God thinks, then you need to read your Bible because that is God talking to you. Right. And if I found out anything, it don't matter if you're male, female, young, or old in here, God wants to talk to you. Right. And if you'll let God talk to you, he'll do it through this book. Right. He ain't going to do it no other way. He's going to do it through the Bible. Right. And uh, he'll tell you what he thinks, and he'll tell you what you need to think. Right. And in this passage of Scripture, he said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, that got him in some trouble when he was here. The position that he held while he was here, he never relinquished it. When he came, when God came down from heaven to this earth, he never did say that he was less than what he was in heaven. He said, this is a mind that you ought to have. Matter of fact, when he spoke to uh, uh, a maid, uh, he, he told her in Luke one thirty five, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yes. He always told them who he was. I am the Son of God. Amen. That got him in a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, after his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. What a blessing that is. Yes. Now, heaven recognized him as, That's my Son. Yes. That's my boy. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. Uh, Jesus himself, after he had been born and lived his life, the Bible didn't say a whole lot about his raising. Right. It just talked about a baby in a manger. But look, God don't have to say a whole lot to tell you a whole lot. Right, right. He said in Luke 4, 16, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Right. When he went home and was subjected under his mother and father, you know what they did every Saturday morning? They got up, there's no question that's going to the synagogue. Right. And that's what it ought to be down to our house. No question about what's going to happen. Sir, you ought to get up and just tell your family it's time to go to church. Yeah. Your kids ought to roll out of the bed knowing that you're heading in that direction. That's what Mary and Joseph did. They just done what they said. And uh, look here, it talked about when Jesus was a little boy and they lived in the house and they brought the gifts to him. Then it talked about when he's 12 at the temple. So he didn't say a whole lot, but he told a whole lot about what he did. He lived a very long. He became a carpenter. And he done that work. And look, when he announced his ministry from his home church in Luke 4, and that's a good place to start your ministry, your home church. 
And he declared to them, I am the Son of God. A lot of them didn't believe him. Well, you're a good fellow, and we can't think of nothing bad to say about you, but we just don't know if you're the Son of God. He said, but that's who I am. Yeah. He said, I am the Messiah. When he got to preaching and moving about in Matthew 16, he asked those disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist. That's pretty high cotton right there, son. I mean, uh, he said, some of them say you're Elias. He was a miracle worker. Some of them say you're Jeremiah. So that means he's a pretty tough preacher every once in a while because Jeremiah was known for his hard preaching. And I wouldn't give you 10 cents for a preacher that didn't pester you every once in a while. Didn't plow your role on occasion about something you're doing that's so you can just get right with God and stay close to Him. Yeah. But He said, But who do you say that I am? Yeah. And without a thought, Peter jumped up and he said, I believe you're the Messiah. He said, You're the one that done tested Him by the Scriptures and said, We have found Him of whom Moses and the prophets spoke about. He said, This is Him. He met all the scriptural criteria of being the Son of God and Peter with all of His faults and failures. He said, You are the Christ. He said, You're the Messiah. He said, Don't tell nobody else. You know, look here, heaven has to reveal that to you. Jesus is just nothing more than a totem pole to some people. He's just another God. Jesus is just another idol set around. He's something far different. Friend, I'm telling you, when God reveals to you who he is, you need to do something about that. You know why? Because that's God in heaven speaking to you. And he said, Let this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, you need to remember who he is. The father was well pleased, but look here. The world wasn't pleased with who he said he was. They got mad. Matter of fact, in John 5, 18, he said, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. When he said, I'm the son of God, you know what he said? He said, I am God. Yeah. Now, when people say that, we kind of shake our head. Right. I've seen some of these guys declare their self God, and I watch them get old and die. Yeah. Right. Mine ain't done that, amen? Right. But he said, I'm God. And he said, he said, the world wanted to kill him because it broke the Sabbath day. And he said, I'm God. I'm equal with God. They said, that's, that's death penalty stuff right there. Now he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what we need to do? We don't need to forget who we are. You know what the Bible calls us? He said, we are sons of God. We're not God. We're not deity. But we're his children. And you need to realize that, who you are. When Paul spoke about himself, he said, look. He said, uh, the world says we are the filth of the world. The world totally disregards who we are. Right. We're salt and we're light. And look here, friend, God put us here to preserve life, to pass on life, and to tell a story that will change the whole world and make a difference, not only in this life, but in their eternity. You don't need to hold your head down. He said, we're ambassadors for Christ. Amen. Look here, friend, we are royal priesthood. He said, look, we need to act like it sometime. Look here, you know what royal families are all about? I mean, all the pomp, all the circumstance, all the gifts and the glory that goes with it. Hey, God Almighty said, you are children of God. And that's a blessing. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been poor and you got a little bit in your pocket today, life is good. Amen? That's right. But he said, we're sons of God. First John chapter 3. And verse 1 said, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Ain't that a blessing? I mean, the Lord looks at us like Christian does his little girl. Like that's the greatest kid in the world, the smartest kid in the world, the cutest kid in the world. And if he didn't think that, he would be weird. Right? Now, I think Red was that. There's a little boy who goes to our church, and he's the cutest little boy you'd ever see. His name is Red. I tell him all the time, you are the cutest little second boy named Red ever met in my life. You're the second one I've ever met in my life. So cute. He's 28 now. 
I still think he's smarter than your kids. Look here, that's why the Lord looks at us. He looks at what we're doing down here, just worshiping him. He says, I'm pleased with that. You know what you do? Sometimes you, you, you look at yourself and you know everything wrong about yourself, but you forget about all them things that are right about yourself. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You don't need to forget the position that God gave you in this world. They ask me every once in a while, who are you with? I said, I'm with the church. I'm going to roll with Jesus till I fall over dead. I done made up my mind. There ain't a better group of people I'm going to run around with. You bunch of nerds and squares and whatever else they want to call you in this world. Look here, thank God Almighty, I'm a part of the family of God. I ain't ashamed of that. We got some freaks in here. Every family's got freaks. Amen. We got our freaks too. But you know what? They're our freaks. I had 11 siblings. I, I probably slapped every one of them, talked about every one of them, was mean to every one of them, but I loved every one of them. I was good to every one of them, and I could say mean things about them, but you couldn't. And if somebody got on one of us, son, trust me, the whole tribe came down on them. It was a bad day. And look here, I'm glad I've got the truth. It's the Bible. I'm glad I got a place where I can go where I know God meets with his people. It's still down at the house of God. He looked at that woman in Luke to, uh, 848 and he said, Daughter, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Yeah. Ain't that a good reason to worship? He said, You go, we're sons and daughters of God, and we need to have that mindset. Yeah. The world don't think much of us, but the Lord does. He said we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That, that's nobility. He said a peculiar people. The Lord wants to understand who you are. You don't never forget that. But you know what uh, really bothers people? Kids that's had everything, they're just little arrogant jerks. Ain't that the kid? I mean, uh, me and my brother-in-law was talking one day. Me and David was brought up a little different. And our kids... And I said, you know, our kids are those kids that we used to hate. <laughs> I said, you know, they, lived in, uh, they live in a neighborhood where we always wanted to live. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But, but we've reminded ours that, hey, I am the provider. I heard Bill Cosby say this once. I hate to quote him in the pulpit, but I thought it was pretty good. His kids on their show was saying, you know, those kids don't like me because I'm rich. He said, look, you're not rich. You're poor. I'm rich. <laughs> you have nothing without me. Amen. Amen. You need to realize that. If you're driving a nice car to school, son, you need to thank your mom and your dad. Yeah, right. Amen. If you got good clothes and sleeping in a good bed and, and if you ate everything in the cabinets today and everything that you've ate in these restaurants over the years, you, if you ate it all today, you would die. You need to thank God for all that stuff. Right. And you need to thank your mom and daddy too. Yeah. Yeah. But look here. He told him, look, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought not right to be equal with God, but he said he made himself of no reputation. Right. You know what he did? He didn't come down here and make a name for himself. Though he did make a name for himself 2,000 years ago. over, We're still talking about him like he was alive last week. Yeah, right. Amen. Right. He said, and took upon himself the form of a serpent was made in the likeness of men. Yeah. You know what God wants you to do? He said, the mind of Christ was this. He was a servant. Yeah. He, he was a man that came here to, to, uh, to make no reputation. Uh, we, uh, you know what reputation is? What people think about us. I want them to think good about me. Whatever your, your try, what reputation you're trying to build. Look here. He said he took upon him the form of a servant. One thing you need to remember. Even though you're God's children, you know what you are? You're a servant. Right. You know, we, we need to remember what servants are all about. Mark 10, 45 said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come for somebody to wait on him. He came to wait on somebody. You know what he did? He helped people when he was here. 
And I don't know about you, but when he helped people, he walked by and he healed the sick. And, uh, you know, when he was here, he helped the hurting. There's a lot of people hurting today. And we need to realize it's bigger than our front porch and our front yard. Uh, there, there's people that don't have what we have. I mean, uh, I was thinking, I saw those kids and those, those two girls singing here, and, and I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of things they did miss out on. You know, I, they, I, I've never been an office guy, and they put me in an office at the prison. They gave me an office, and I hate it a lot of times. I sit there, but it, I'm learning that it's a good thing. Because sometimes some of those young guys come down there that won't come to church, and they sit in there, and they start talking to me. And they just start pouring out their heart. And they, they start telling me stuff. And I get the privilege of taking my Bible and, and talking to them. One of them said, I'd just like to come down here. He said, you just drop some wisdom on me. I said, well, it's like talking to my son. He's 28. Uh, some of them are 18 and 19 years old. I, I said, it's just like talking to my son. And I tell them what I would tell mine. And I show them what I showed mine. And, and I think to myself, uh, thank God when they leave my office, they, they've hugged my neck. And, and they said, preacher, I feel a little bit better than what I did when I come in here. Amen. I say, thank God for that. Amen. Sometimes they're telling about stuff that's won in their life and what they've done and how broke they are about it. You ought to thank God you ain't got a guilty conscience. I know some of you boys and girls probably watch something you wasn't supposed to watch, but trust me, there's a lot worse things could be in your head. Amen? But anyway, he fed the hungry. You know what he did? He would preach to them, and, uh, and he told them, and, and he helped them spiritually, and he helped them socially. Look here, we ain't no social club. We here to elect the next president we ain't no political party right, right. but you know what we need to do we need to get involved with this neighborhood out here right, right. you need to let them know manual Baptist is here and we do more and preach and pray and shout and carry on over here we want to let them know hey man if you got a need we're here to help you yeah. there's a preacher friend of mine up in Delaware he said every time a house burns down this neighborhood he said would they come to church or not go over there, we give them $500 say you're going to need some cash, we get their clothes size and we do all that and we let them know hey we are praying for you, you don't have to come to church we just want you to know this church has got your back Amen I mean I, I, I like churches that get involved in those street missions those jail ministries now, I love it when they, they're out there and they're just serving, they're saying hey when you get out of jail or you get off these streets and you need a, you're really looking for some help and you want some stability, just come over there. We'll love you just like you are. Treat you as good as we would anybody else. We just want you to know that we are here to help you. He said that was a mind of Jesus Christ. He looked at humanity and he saw that they was in trouble. He helped them spiritually and he helped them socially. Look, the church in America and America itself is a very generous nation. We give away. Look, I'm so tired of everybody talking about us being tightwads. We've gave so much to the Palestinians. We've gave so much down through Africa. And their leaders are saying, no, look here. The top, I think I read this past week, the top five uh, leaders of Hamas are billionaires. Now, somebody's stealing some money. Amen. When you go down through Africa, we look here since I was a kid. Them commercials about Africa have been on. They've been trillions of dollars sent down there. Their leaders are sitting on gold thrones. They're still living in little shacks and walking around wrapped up in rags and doing without. There's something wrong with that picture. Right. Amen. Hey, man, I don't know much, but I know better than that. I know we're generous and people take advantage. But look, I thank God for the church of God that does so much for this country. I mean, friend, I'm telling you, you took away all the charitable work we've done. Look here, looked it all to the government like a lot of them won't. Look what a mess they've done about everything else. Right. They ain't never run nothing good. If you run your store or your bank account like they did, you'd be in jail. But anyhow, that's just me preaching. But Jesus helped people. In Matthew 9, when he was out there preaching in verses 36 through 38, 
He was preaching, and then he got to looking at everybody. And they were sheep, as sheep scattered abroad, having no shepherd. They needed somebody to lead them, give them a light, give them some guidance. And you know what he said? He didn't say, fellas, you need to pray that we can work miracles and do signs and wonders. He said, we need to pray that the Lord would send forth laborers into the harvest. Can I tell you what God is looking for? He ain't looking for leaders. He's looking for laborers. You know what a laborer is? Look here, I don't know about you, but if you work at a convenience store, I did. That ain't no career, that's a job. You know what you are? You're a laborer. Amen? I mean, they're just some, they're just people just full after laboring. They got no direction. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I was crazy as a gnat in a whirlwind. I was every direction. It was so good. When I got saved, when I got saved, I got some peace and some joy. I got some contentment. Uh, I got some love in my heart. I mean, I I got uh, some long suffering. I got some grace. But you know what? I got all that from God. I started reading my Bible. I started watching people in our church. And you know what I got? Son, I wasn't just some sheep out there wondering. I had somebody had me on a leash and they was pulling me in the right direction. I'd got people said, you can't do that anymore. And I, I, I think, well, I've got to stop this and I've got to stop that. And I'm doing what all them said. And then one day I thought, I'm just going to read the Word of God. Let God tell me what to do. Let Him lead me. And trust me, friend, that straight and narrow ain't, ain't so hard when you start reading what he said and doing what he said. That's where that life is that's abundant. I'm telling you what a blessing it is to know that you are headed in the right direction. Amen. I ain't lost my mind. No. Some, I mean, I had a preacher friend of mine tell me one time, he said, I'm not kidding, Larry. I think you're a little crazy. <laughs> well, look, I can't help it that I'm right all the time. I tell my son, I said, it is awesome being right 100% of the time. (laughs) Amen. Anyway, I know you don't believe that. Look here, you know what? Brother Doug is not the Lord here, but he is the leader. And you know what? Um, uh, Joshua was a servant to Moses. Amen. Amen. The apostles were servants of Christ. And we're to serve one another. He said, Galatians 5, 13, by love, serve one another. He tells us to be subject one to another. Romans 15, verses 1 through 3, he said, we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. There's some of you folks in here spiritually, you're stronger. I mean, your family stronger financially. Actually, you're stronger. I mean, just uh, being of sound mind and body, you are stronger, and you need to bear the infirmities of the weak. When I first got saved, people, they, they tell me now. So I, I'd never read the Bible before I got saved. My mother got saved. Things started changing our house. And they said, you used to ask some of the dumbest questions. And we would look so serious and we would talk to you and we would pray with you and then we'd get in our car and we'd laugh all the way home and said, that boy's an idiot. <laughs> he might think, I don't know. Amen. First Peter 5, 5 said, we ought to be subject one to another. He's the leader, he ain't the Lord. But he ought to submit to you and you ought to submit to him and we all ought to submit to the Lord and realize we're laborers together right. with God. What a privilege. What a privilege. The purpose he came, let me finish right here. I've got two or three more points. I ain't going to preach that long. I know y'all got family stuff. He said he humbled himself in verse 8 and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The purpose he came and the reason why we're here. He said, you need to have this mindset. You're a sacrifice. He came to be a sacrifice. He became obedient. He said he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Whether you believe it or not. I have people, you know, he's the Savior of all men. 
I have people tell me, I don't believe that's why. I don't mean it makes it disappear, son. Right. You're just wrong. Right. Amen? Right. How do you know I'm wrong? Because the Bible says you was. How do you know the Bible's right? Because it says so. That's all I need. That's another message. No time, 6,000 years under scrutiny. It's passed every test, and you ain't got one it can't pass. But anyway, but he said he became a sacrifice. You know, most people, they like to think of themselves as good. You know, when you look at yourself, oh, I'm good. I remind people all the time, no, you're not. You're not good. Now, look, I, I, you've got to have, there's a fine line between this, you being a son of God, and you thinking you're just the bee's knees, as some people say. Right. You know what I'm saying? Most of the world out there, you know why a lot of them are in churches that are not telling the truth today? And, and the reason they give charitably, and the reason they get involved socially, they're doing all that stuff because... They think it makes them good. It don't make you good. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Look, most people need to realize you're not the prize. You're not the goose that lays the golden eggs. You're not. I've told this here before. My son went to public school from the first grade or kindergarten to the sixth grade. Then he finished out in Christian school and he went to college and God, did he get an education there? Yeah, I said, you get one there. But anyway, when I preached at his Christian school, he said, Dad, these kids hate it when you preach here. I said, you know what? I hate preaching here. It's all good. I used to look at him and I'd say, Son, you, I will see you at prison. I would point that girl out and I'd say, You need to get right with God. You're headed for trouble. You know what? He sits on the front row at Bledsoe Correctional, takes notes, and he tells all them other inmates he killed his girlfriend. And he said, you know, if I'd listened to that guy at, at Christian school, I wouldn't be in prison taking notes. His, his, that, that girl, she's had two children out of wedlock. She's a street-walking drug addict. She's got all the talent in the world, could play the piano, the violin, and, and done all that stuff. And she's an atheist now. She's still wrong. And she ain't learned yet. He ain't broke her yet, but can I tell you something, friend? Uh, I used to tell them kids, look, you are not special. You are not good. You're rotten to the core. You're wicked as a devil. You need to repent of your sin, and you need to get right with God. Some of them did, and they're preachers, and they're deacons, and they're Sunday school teachers. Amen? Because, look, you can brag on your kids. They ought to be, hey, my kid's smart. You've seen them? Every kid, when they're two, they're Einstein to their parents. You know, they can say they're ABCs. Yeah, oh, hey, great. Going to be a sophomore at Stanford next year. <laughs> right? But look, that's the way we ought to treat them. But we ought to remind them, when it comes to getting right with God, we ought to remind them, hey, that's something you're going to have to do. Here's what God said about you being a sinner. Here's what he said about him being your sacrifice. And you're going to have to repent of your sins. And you're going to have to get saved on your own. You're not going to go to heaven, Mom and Daddy. Amen? And look, he reminded them of those things. In Hebrews 9, 12, he said, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having eternal, eternal redemption for us. I mean, when the, the blood of those goats and those calves, that religion of the day, when he said, look, I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm tired of all this ritual. He said, look, uh, there was a one man one day in eternity. A friend, uh, and, and days gone by, Jesus Christ died for our sins, past, present, and future. Ever seen before him, ever seen after him, ever seen during him. He died for all of them. Look here, friend, before you were sought about, Jesus died for your sins. Only God coming from heaven could do that very thing. And he said, I was a sacrifice. Amen. What a blessing that is. Amen. He said, don't make no sense. A lot of the Bible don't make sense to me, but it's true. Right. 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 Amen. He said, look, for the blood of bulls and of goats 
and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh that purified you for a year he said how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the, through, through the eternal spirit offer himself to God purge your conscience from dead works <coughs> to serve the living God Amen. ain't that a blessing after you got saved he purged your conscience from dead works yeah. worthless works to serve the living God yeah. you know why I tell people we have we're passing our Christmas cards this year you know what one of them officers told us he said you know he said I don't know why y'all doing this he, these people are animals they don't deserve nothing and I'm thinking, who are you to say they're animals? I think you're one for saying that. Look here, I'm not some bleeding heart liberal. I don't believe in the electric chair. I believe in the electric bleachers. Amen. Look, you start, you start carrying that, somebody's going to calm down. But look here, I do believe that all men, it don't matter who they are. I have some guys in prison say, look, I murdered somebody, but I didn't molest no kid. They're self-righteous in prison. I told one, my nephew stood over a man and unloaded the gun in when he was 18 years old, and I watched him walk out of prison after he was over 50 years old, and he told me one day, he said, I don't go to church with child molesters. Well, I don't particularly care about it myself. I said, but you know what? I said, yeah, I know that guy's parents. I know what you've done. You took everything he ever had, ever will have. I said, those people died miserable. I said, you know what? Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. That's a big place, a lot of sin. I've only read about one he won't forgive. Now, there's some I won't forgive you of, but he said he would forgive you of them. Amen. If he said he'll forgive you of them, I'm okay with that. I'm the preacher. I ain't the Savior. I preach to the world and let them know, hey, you can come. You can repent of your sin, and you can be born again. Amen. No matter what you've done, that's what the blood of Christ was for. He was for all of our sin. I don't know about you, but I've never forgot by about 40 something years ago, about 48, I think, something like that, Doug, 46, 1978, when a long haired redneck full of the, uh, the devil in the world, when he went to that altar and got saved by the grace of God, and he made me a brand new person. I've never forgot who I was and where I was headed. I know who I am. I know where I'm going to wind up. I've got nothing but praise and honor for. Lord Jesus Christ I ain't going to calm down be anything I'm going to get worse I'm going to get worse when they say you can't say I say I'll say anything I want I remember one time I preached revival here and y'all was betting on what I would say that would be socially unacceptable amen I can't help if church full of softies. <laughs> I've had preachers say, I didn't know if I was going to have a job when that guy got done. I'd like to know why we have to calm down. Your preacher, when he preaches, I know how Doug preaches. When he preaches on stuff, he ain't been mean, he's been helpful. He's not just preaching to you all, he's preaching to his crew too. Look here. His wife and kids are like my wife and kids. They get out of bounds sometimes. They got to be brought back too. You get out of bounds. The best of you in here, you get out of bounds, you got to be brought back. Amen. What better person to do that than a man of God that will preach to you? But anyway, 1 Peter 3, 18, that's why I preached to them guys the other night. For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he, not we, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I said, Jesus died, was buried, rose again. You want to repent of your sins and receive that message, you can be saved. Right. Amen? Yes. And you know what we're here for? We're here to be a sacrifice. Yes, I know this crew right here. They have sacrificed for the church. They're still sacrificing for this church. Their kids, they turned out okay. Amen. I, I know worse kids, not much, but I know worse kids. <laughs> Amen. There's a lot of things they sacrifice to get right here. There's a lot of preachers who would love to have Emmanuel Baptist Church. Sure. Matter of fact, I was telling my son there, I said, Doug, I preached for him when he had a church that nobody wanted. 
And when he had a handful of people here at Emmanuel, I said, his church got big, his name got big, and I said, he took me with him. I said, that's a good thing. Amen? And I've seen him sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind of Christ is we're here to sacrifice. Yes. Yes. We're here to sacrifice our time, our talents, our ability. I was looking at this building. This building looks like a movie set. I don't know who cleans this place. There ain't a cobweb in this joint. I mean, ain't, I mean look here, I don't know who you are, but they ought to pay you more. Because it looks good in here. Amen. 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 This property always looks good. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of sacrifice. Sometimes when somebody says, I'm tired, God comes home and says, I gotta go mow the churchyard. I gotta go up there and clean up the church because we have not church. Some guy says, Look, man, you know, why are you writing that check over at that church? I can give you a good idea why. So you have all this property. So you can pay guys like me to go to prison and preach to guys like them. Amen? That's why you do all that stuff. Sacrifice. Some of you, uh, today, you're going to come back to church tonight. And your family's going to say, why are you leaving? Why we got church tonight? So they, be able to sacrifice. they think you're crazy. And you're thinking, I'd really like to stay, but I really like going over there. Now, if you don't, don't feel bad. I ain't trying to make you feel bad. Shouldn't I try to make them feel bad? Okay, feel bad. Amen. But it's a sacrifice sometimes. You've got to sacrifice your comfort. You've got to sacrifice your pleasure sometimes for the benefit of others. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for Brother Doug. Thank you for this church. Well, thank that you have a prominence in eternity. Your people is going to have a prominence in eternity. Those 30, 60, and 100 fold Christians, those that's going to rule and reign in the millennial. Lord, that, that prominence you're going to give us. Lord, help us to realize we're sons of God, but we're servants of God. Lord, help us to realize we're here to be a sacrifice. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to give what we got to you. Well, no matter how big or how little, there's no small jobs with God, no little talents with you. I pray that you'd help us to sacrifice them on these altars and give ourselves for the glory of God. Do we see your face in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.